19, especially looking at what has been referred to as the sin of unbelief. And so as we get into the study, hopefully we'll be able to see what that really does mean, the sin of unbelief. Beginning, beginning at verse 7 and uh, reading to verse 19, the writer writes, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion." For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now, with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And so the writer is now developing something for us that he had begun earlier in the chapter. I want to pick up, as I normally do in verse 6, the verse prior to what we're going to be looking at, and want to remind you of a few things, because in verse 6 here in chapter 3, he had just spoken concerning a genuine conversion experience. He had said in verse 6, uh, Christ as the son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. He's speaking about somebody who's actually saved, a genuine conversion experience. And he was saying that we have a relationship with God. We're now the temple of God if we receive Christ and have a permanent change of heart. He speaks concerning holding fast there. To hold fast means to keep secure, to keep firm possession of something. And so he's writing about a genuine born-again experience. And so he's warning them. Even as he's about to here in verse 7 pick up and, and develop that, he's warning them to make sure that they are truly saved. You see, they need to uh, check their own hearts. And I think that's a good practice, by the way, and it's something that every believer ought to uh, be sensitive to do because we need to check our own hearts to see whether or not we have been born again. In the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, in chapter 13, verse 5, Paul said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? And there is this point, I believe, of soul searching. Has Christ really taken residence in my heart? Am I born again or do I think that I'm saved because I've begun to go to church? Do I think that I'm saved because I've gone through a religious experience like a baptism or something of that nature? Do I think I'm saved because I've inherited from my mom and my dad certain morals and all? Does that make me a Christian? Well, Paul would say, examine your heart to see whether or not you are in the faith. In the Old Testament book of Lamentations, in chapter 3, verse 40, the Bible says, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. And so, there are people who attend church services and always will be people who attend church services who, who attend but are not born again. Jesus actually spoke concerning this in the, in the Gospel of Matthew and, and, and made the point that, that there would be many people going to church in the latter days who haven't really been saved. I want to point that to you by turning you to Matthew chapter 13 for a moment. Would you turn there with me, please? Matthew chapter 13. And I want to show you this in one of the parables that Jesus gave, which is called the parable of the wheat and tares. You see, in the New Testament book of Matthew, Jesus gives us, in chapter 13, eight parables. One of those parables is found in verse 24 following, and, and that has been referred to as a parable of the wheat and tares. I'm not going to give you the entire parable teaching tonight, but we gleaned from it something to, to make the point that, that in the last days there will be many people who go to church who aren't even saved. Here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, uh, it says, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? He said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares, bind them in bundles, burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus has given a simple parable here, the wheat and the tares. The tares look identical to the wheat until they come to full maturation. They look the same as they're growing up, as they're sprouting until the very end. And then the tares, which is darnel, which is a weed, is differentiated from the wheat. But as it's growing up together with the wheat, you can't tell the difference. And in the church, there are going to be those that would be referred to as wheat, and there are those who are going to be referred to as tares, the tares alongside of the wheat. You can't tell the difference until the very end. You see, in verse 36, it says, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. His disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said, He who sows the good seeds, the son of man, the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. So even within the body of Christ in terms of the visible church, even within the church services, you will have those that Jesus would refer to as wheat. They're genuine, born-again believers, love the Lord. And you have others that have the appearance of being Christians, but they are in reality tares. And so it's a very good uh, thing for us as we turn back to Hebrews. Uh, it's a very good thing for us to be checking out our own heart. Whether or not I'm walking with Christ, whether or not I've been born again, whether or not I've been genuinely converted, because the phony often will be scattered amongst the genuine. You see, a genuinely converted person can be tempted to return to the old way of life. Every born-again believer in this room runs that risk. I know I have been tempted many times over the last many years that I've been walking with the Lord to return to the old life many times. I have found myself in positions where I could make a choice. Do I want to return? Do I want to go back to what I was? Or do I want to remain faithful to Christ? Every one of us in this room has an opportunity one time or another, probably multitudes of times in, in the course of a, a lifetime, of making that choice. Do I want to return to what I was, go back to where I was, or do I want to continue following the Lord? The fact is a new creation remains with the Lord Jesus Christ. They will not return. They remain committed to Christ. And you see this throughout the Scriptures. If you take notes, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to the Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 15, 4. Abide in me, I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing, in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. 1 John 2.24, see that uh, what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will remain in the Son and in the Father. There is a continuation. There's an abiding. There is a, a moving on in the things of the Lord. It is possible for you to be tempted, and the temptation comes in a variety of ways, but it comes. It may come through disappointment. It may come through friends. It may come through a broken relationship. It may come through a disappointment in a job that you wanted to get and didn't get. It can come in a variety of ways. When people are going to be saying to you or spiritually you're going to just have a strong urgency to move away from the Lord and move back to what you used to have. And that's a possibility and it does happen. And if I were to ask people in this room how many of you have experienced that, I'm, I'm supposing every one of us has gone through that. Every one of us has, has gotten to the point where the Lord says, do you also want to go away? That's a very common thing for that question to be given to believers. Do you also want to go away? Am I, Jesus could say, am I turning out to be different than what you thought I was? Are you disappointed in how I'm working in your life? Did you think that when you got saved that you'd end up with that guy that you really wanted to have now that you're a Christian? Do you think that when you got saved that everything would become just perfect on the job and there'd be no more pressure now that you're a believer? Did you think that? There are so many ways that question comes. But the bottom line is, is we'll hear the question, but we don't respond by saying, yes, I want to go away, and yes, I will go away. That's the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit. The counterfeit has no root in Christ. The counterfeit has a relationship with him, and therefore, when pressure comes and all 
They succumb to it and they return to their old life. It's like the dog that returns to its vomit or the pig that returns to the mud that it had been washed from. The dog returns to the vomit because by nature, a dog is a dog. But a born-again believer may want to return to that mud that we used to, you know, roll around in. But we can't stay there. And the reason is, is because by nature, we're no longer a pig. By nature, we're no longer a dog. By nature, we're new creations. And though we have disappointments and, and sometimes we might even succumb to temptation, ultimately, we will wake up to it and say, why am I here? Why am I doing this? i got to get out of this as fast as possible and return to the Lord. Because God has done a work in your life. And that's how it works. And so, yes, it's, it's possible for a genuinely converted person to be tempted to return to the old life. They might even go back and taste of the gutter water that they were drinking at one time, thinking it was good. But they'll realize, no, this isn't the way it is. I have so much more in the Lord, and they won't return. And so he is saying here in verse 6, uh, Christ, the son of his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So it continues now in verse 7 by saying, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart, hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. And therefore I was angry with that generation, and said they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." And so as we begin, I want to uh, point something very briefly out to you, but it's really actually very important. I want you to see verse 7, how he says this. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice. A couple things I want to point out. One is he is ascribing personhood to the Spirit of God. Now, that may not mean anything to you right now, but the fact is, is we are what are called Trinitarians. We believe in one God manifested in three persons. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. So you have Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are those who would say that the Holy Spirit is not a person. There are some non-Christian cults that will claim that they are Christian, but when asked, is the Holy Spirit a person, they will say, no, he's an energy. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that he is not a person, but he's an energy, or he's like the wind. And yet, I want you to see what verse 7 says. It says, as the Holy Spirit says. Now, I've heard of the whispering wind, but the wind really doesn't speak. The Holy Spirit does speak, because the Holy Spirit is a person. A person speaks, energy cannot. And you see this in Scripture more than once. I could, I could give you many scriptural incidents of this, but let me give you a couple. Acts 8, 29, the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Or Acts chapter 10, verse 19, while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Or Acts chapter 13, verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So the Holy Spirit speaks the point that he's making here is that it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the psalm that is being spoken of right here. You see in verse 7, he is actually quoting Psalm 95. Later on in the next chapter, in chapter 4, he actually ascribes Psalm 95 to David. Yet he doesn't say in verse 7, therefore as King David wrote. What he says is, therefore as the Holy Spirit says. And then he says what the Spirit had prompted David to write. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. And so the Bible, the Word of God, is not a work of man's ingenuity. It's inspired by God. In 2 Samuel 23, 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His Word was on my tongue. 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so he's pointing out to us that David wasn't the one who wrote that psalm. David was inspired by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit was speaking as David was writing. And so the Holy Spirit is speaking concerning the Jewish nation. And what the Holy Spirit had to say to the Israelites a thousand years earlier still applied at that time. Now notice what the Spirit said. The Spirit said, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. 
Notice how he says, if you will hear his voice. In other words, you have the ability to hear and respond. If you will hear his voice, speaks about a decision of the will. When the Holy Spirit speaks to me through his word, I can say yes to what he's saying, or I can ignore him. You know, God wants to speak to us, and he does so through the Bible. And so even as David had been inspired by the Spirit of God to write, even so the people who are reading this passage when they were reading it originally, you know, a thousand years after David had written it, are still being addressed by God. And the point he's making is you need to incline your heart towards God so that when God speaks, you can receive what he has to say. You know, um, I have four kids, and as they were growing up, there were times when I, and I know this will surprise you, when I lectured them. I know that you don't think that happened, but of course it did often. As a matter of fact, I lectured them so much it became basically just the way it was. I used to take an offering after it. But anyway, we would speak to the, I would speak to them and I would lecture them. And, you know, just like I was with my father, my kids were with me, and to this day still are, even as adults. You know, I can know when the lights are on, nobody's home. I know when I'm talking to them and they're not listening. I know that they can nod at me and say yes and listen and all of that when in reality they're not hearing. There are times when you can hear and there are times when you refuse to hear. There were times when my dad would give me the lecture that he would give me when he once in a while would, would catch up with me and, and, and I would know when to nod my head. I would know when to look sad like, boy, I really messed up. I would know when to agree with him, but I wasn't listening to a thing he was saying. I was watching his mouth move like some of you are doing right now to me, I would watch his mouth move, but I wasn't listening. And, and, and my father, you know, was wise enough to pick up on that. And so I know that when I'm speaking to my kids, there are times when I will actually say to them, if you will listen, you will be blessed. If you are willing to hear what your father has to say, I can help you. Because guess what? I've been there, I've done that, I've learned, and I can give you some wisdom if you're willing to hear. Much of the time they don't. They want to forge their own testimony. They want to go their own way. They want to make their own mistakes. From my perspective, I've never seen the reasonableness of that since I got saved and since I got hold of the Word of God and since I began to realize that wisdom is in a multitude of counselors and sometimes God wants to instruct us if we simply would listen. And that's what's taking place here. He says, you need to listen to what God says. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, said they, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest." And so he uses the children of, of Israel as an example of those who didn't listen when God would speak. They continually tested him, is what he's saying, for 40 years while they wandered in the wilderness. You see, they had been in bondage in Egypt, and as they had been in bondage, God had raised up to them, or for them, a, a deliverer, a man by the name of Moses. And God used this deliverer, this Moses, uh, in a, a miraculous way. And you know the story how that he brought uh, through Moses 10 plagues on the nation of Egypt. And ultimately, uh, those plagues, each one of them individually being a judgment on one of the gods the Egyptians worshipped. Ultimately, even the death of the firstborn, which resulted in the release of the nation of Israel. And so after they left, they began to wander. And as they began to move out of the uh, of that experience of bondage, they came to a place where they were thirsty. God provided water from a rock. God then began to provide for them uh, manna from heaven so that they were not hungry, and he sustained them. As a matter of fact, he completely cared for them as they were out there in a way that they had never been cared for before. Deuteronomy 29.5 says, during the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes didn't wear out, and the, nor did the sandals on your feet. I cared for you in every way, shape, and form that's possible. And as you read that, as you read how God delivered them, you see that God went before them. He met with them in the tabernacle. He gave them his law. He defeated their enemies. He preserved them in every way possible. Yet in spite of that, the history of the nation of Israel is one of continuous rebellion against God. And you see it over and over and over again. When it was time to bring them into the promised land, once again they, they rebelled against him. And that's when God finally judged them and dealt with them severely. 
Numbers 14 tells us in verses 21 through 23, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. You see, they got concerned because in the book of Numbers chapter 13, God had said, send 12 spies, one representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Send them out there into the land. Let them spy it from the south to the north and everywhere in between. And let them come back and bring to you a testimony of what they've seen. Well, they did. They went and they spent some time there. They spied it out. They even brought back a cluster of grapes that was so huge that it took two men and they carried it on a, on a, on a pole and they brought it back and they said, the place is incredible. It is so lush and so beautiful, it is unbelievable, but there's a problem. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is there are giants, and we are as grasshoppers in our own sight before them. They are so huge, we are like grasshoppers. If we go into this land and try and take it, we're going to be slaughtered. There's absolutely no way that we can take this land. Well, Joshua and Caleb stand up and say, listen, let's take it. God is on our side. There's no reason why we can't take it. If God goes before us, who's going to stand before us? We can do it. But they were so upset at Joshua and Caleb, they even wanted to kill him for for even suggesting that they ought to trust the Lord. And that's why God got so upset. And he said, listen, you guys are afraid that your children are going to be slaughtered and die. Well, let me tell you what's going to actually happen. Everyone 20 years of age and under are going to enter into the promised land. The ones that you're so concerned about, And everyone above that age is going to end up dying in the wilderness. And they tested God, rebelled against God, and ultimately didn't enter into the promise because of the sin of unbelief. So that's what he means in verse 11 when he says, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, contrary to today's mentality, God does not ignore unbelief, and God doesn't ignore resistance. God's grief at the continued disobedience became wrath at their hardness of heart. And because of this, he excluded them from the promised rest. And therefore, they did not have a permanent and safe dwelling place. He said, because of their unbelief, they hardened themselves. They're not going to enter in. Hardening yourself. When you harden your heart, it's like a soft heart becoming as tough as beef jerky. And and God doesn't have entrance because we've become hardened towards him. That's why he's saying in verse 8, don't harden your hearts. And he goes on in verse 9, where your fathers test me, proved me, saw my works for 40 years. And therefore, I was angry with that generation. They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. They've known the works. They've seen the manna. They've seen the quail. They have seen the way God has gone before them, protected them, provided for them in every way but they didn't know his ways. And there was always going to be a difference between knowing the works of God and the ways of God. The person who knows the works of God is able to recite things they've read in the Bible, how that Jesus did certain works, how he walked on water, fed the 5,000, cast out demons, healed the sick, raised the dead. You can speak concerning those things because you've read them in the Bible. There are people who are able to speak in that way and say, well, I've read the Scriptures and it says thus and so. There are others who, not are, who are not only able to speak concerning what he did, but they're also able to explain why he did that. And there's a difference between only being able to say, well, I know what he did and knowing why he did what he did. As I've shared with you so many times, my, my wife can, can tell you what I did, but she can also tell you why I did that. Where many people can say, well, I saw Pastor Dave did this. My wife can say, and this is the reason why. Because she knows not only my works, she knows my ways. And there's a difference between knowing works alone and knowing the ways of God. And some people are able to talk about Jesus Christ, but they don't have fellowship with him and don't know the way that he really does work and why he does what he does. So he goes on in verse 12 and says, beware. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Well, it is said today, 
if you hear his voice, if you will hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So notice this exhortation in verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Remain faithful to Christ is this point. Don't follow the example of the faithless Israelites who died in the wilderness and didn't trust the Lord. Notice he speaks in verse 12 of an evil heart of unbelief. That word evil speaks of that simply which is bad or wicked. Unbelief speaks of an absence of faith. So he's saying falling away from God is a result of a sinful, unbelieving heart. And he's issuing a warning against rejecting what they know is truth. And as he's speaking to them, he's saying, listen, you need to know that the things that are being spoken to you are absolutely true. Therefore, embrace them by faith and live by them on a daily basis. Now, if you know that the word of God is true, then obey its revelation, especially as it reveals to us who Jesus Christ is. You see, Jesus said we could actually put his word, if you will, to the test and discover the truthfulness of it. In John 7, 16 and 17, Jesus said, my teaching's not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he'll find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. If you simply do it, I'll reveal myself to you. If you obey it, I'll manifest myself to you. There's a difference between knowing and doing. You know, it's not just saying the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's considering him to be my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not the one who says. It's the one who says and the one who does because the action demonstrates the truthfulness of the statement. And so if I say Jesus Christ is Lord, then I'm going to live as if he is. So to know what is true and to walk away from it is to forfeit the gift that God wants to give you, the gift of salvation. And these Hebrews who are aware of the claims of the gospel is, are being exhorted not to have unbelief. I was talking to somebody, uh, and I've used this trip here so many times um, in the past, but I was speaking to somebody recently. And, you know, in, in churches like this, if you teach long enough, you can, you can talk to the people and you can say, were you here when this particular Bible study was done? And then they'll... They'll answer, yes, I was. And then I can say, then, do you remember when I was teaching the passage and how I, I was teaching this? And, and that happens quite often uh, in this fellowship now. And, and so I'm able to point to uh, previous studies. Or I've even gone so far as not that, not that long ago, I asked somebody, were you in church today? Yes, I was. Did you hear the message that I gave today? Yes, I did. Okay, then. This reminds me of what Jesus said in John chapter 13. When Jesus made a simple statement found in verse 17, he said, if you know these things, then blessed are you if you do them. It's not enough for us to simply know. It's a putting into practice what God has to say. And as you do that, it's demonstrating a trust in the Lord. And beyond that, God begins to manifest himself to you through the obedience. Turn with me to John 14 for a moment. I want to show you something. John chapter 14. I can still remember as a young believer, one of the things that people told me that would be a necessary thing for me as a Christian, as a matter of fact, the day I got saved was that I should share with somebody what God had done in my life. And you know, I actually did that. I've been doing that ever since I got saved, the day I got saved. I mean, when I got saved, I went home and uh, actually I had, uh, I pulled up in front of my parents' house and, and because the day I got saved, I actually had had plans to go with a friend of mine to smoke some pot, and my friend lived across the street from me, uh, I pulled up at my parents' house, and prior to entering into their home, I actually crossed the street and went to the house of my friends, because these were the people I was going to go get loaded with. They were receiving a, a kilo, a shipment from Thailand, and they, they used to, at that time, ship the uh, marijuana in stuffed animals. And that was before they had dogs sniffing through everything and started catching people that way and all. And so you would actually, we actually would receive shipments from Thailand in stuffed animals. It just would stuff the animal with a kilo of, 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 of pot. And, and they were receiving a kilo and had just received it. It was December 27th, and I thought that I would have a belated uh, Christmas experience by smoking some dope, and that's what I was going to do. But I ended up going to a Maranatha concert and, and hearing the gospel and getting saved. And, and the guy who did the follow-up was sharing with me and said to me, you need to read the Word of God, you need to pray, you need to establish relationships with Christians, and you need to tell somebody what God did in your life today. And he really emphasized that. And so when I got home, uh, I remember pulling up there to the side of my parents' uh, uh, house, and, 
And I climbed out of my car, and I crossed the street and went up the street a couple of houses and knocked on the door, and, uh, and uh, the mother of the house opened the door, and I said, are the kids home? And she said, no, they're gone right now, David. And, and I knew basically where they were. They were out smoking some dope. And so I said, well, can I come in? She said, yes. And she had a few of the other kids who were there. She had nine children, and some of the other kids were there. And so I walked into the house. She said, uh, wh- how are you? And I said, I'm fine. And I began to share with the mother, and I shared with the kids who would listen that this is what happened to me today. And I told them, Jesus Christ came into my life. All my sins have been forgiven, and I'm brand new. I don't really know how it works yet, but I want you to know that God has done something in my life. And, and I was amazed because I was afraid. I was afraid. I was very shy and very to myself, and, and religious faith was something that you basically kept to yourself and within yourself. And to actually share something like that was very hard for me to do because I'd never done something like that before. And, and then I went across the street. And I opened up the door, the side door there in my parents' home, and I walked towards the den, and and I stood at the entrance of the den while Mom, Dad, and my two sisters were watching television. And that's when I said, Mom, Dad, and I spoke to my sisters, and I said, I love you. Praise the Lord. And and I walked out, and, and my mom freaks out, and you know the rest of the story, how ultimately I led them to Christ a few weeks later. But my sister Madeline got saved that day, and and so... I began to discover something about the promises of God, and you see it here in John 14, verse 21, when it says, uh, he who has my commandments and, and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. I will manifest myself to him, and I will abide within him. Listen, one of the things you need to know is when you, through obedience, simply trust the Lord, he manifests himself to you, and it's just the obedience to what he says. There's so many times we're afraid to step out in faith and to, and to do what God says. And, and it's really an unbelieving spirit that keeps us from moving forward to seeing what God wants to do. You might think within yourself, well, there are so many other people who are so much more qualified. They're, they're smarter than I. They're more eloquent than I. They're better. Uh, their knowledge of the Bible is better than mine. It's much deeper. Or what happens if I begin to open my mouth and, and I begin to share, and as I do so, uh, they ask me a question that I can't answer, and, and I'm stumped, and I, make God, I may make uh, God look bad and all of that. I'll tell you, I was a brand new Christian. I was only three years old in the Lord. I'm going to a secular college, and I had those doubts also. But every once in a while, not always, not every class, and not in every class, but once in a while, the Holy Spirit would work within me and say, you need to open your mouth. You need to be a witness. You need to share. You need to say something on my behalf. And I used to just be seated there just hoping somebody else would speak, and nobody else would. There would just nobody else in the class would say anything. And I knew that somebody has to speak. Somebody has to say something. Nobody else is. And then I would just I'd take that deep breath, and I would pray, and then I'd say, God, use me. You said if I open my mouth, you'll fill it. You said, it's the spirit of your father who speaks in me, and therefore, Lord, here it goes. And I have to tell you, there were so many times when I'd open up and I'd say, this is what the Bible says, or this is what Jesus Christ promised, and I would say it not in Christian college, in, in secular college, and, and I would say, this is what God's Word says. And as I did that, you know, they didn't all stand up and say, praise him, praise him, hallelujah, how can I be saved? I mean, they sometimes would mock, sometimes they'd say things, you know, sometimes they'd give each other sidelong glances and make me feel stupid. But I knew somebody has to stand up, somebody has to trust the Lord, somebody has to speak forth. And, and I ultimately simply said, well, Lord, if, if, if it's not going to be somebody else, then perhaps it's because it's supposed to be me. And you want to know what happened, guys? I did not want to have a wicked heart of unbelief. I wanted to speak and see what God would do. I encourage you to do the same thing. Some of you have friends and some of you have family members who are are not saved and and, and you're not saying anything to them. You're thinking, well, if I'm just a nice person, let me tell you something. If you run around as a nice person in front of your mom and your dad, they're basically going to simply think they did a good job of raising you. They're just going to think I did a good job. Turned out to be good because I did that. My mom told me one time, she said, you know, um, 
She said something about uh, people um, think that I did a good job in raising you. And I said, you know, um, the Lord Jesus Christ has done a good job in changing me. And that's the truth. My mom poured as much goodness as she could in me, but until Jesus grabbed hold of my heart, none of that was going to work until the Lord grabs hold of you. And so when I got home, I shared with my mom. I shared with my dad. You know, I thought, well, even if they uh, reject me, so what? So what? Their souls are worth the possible conflict. And if they kick me out of the house, so what? You know, I'll, I'll find a place to live because I need them to know Jesus Christ. And when I began to open my mouth and share, Jesus manifested himself in ways to me that, well, to this very day, he continues to do that. I encourage you in the same way. You see, don't be caught up simply knowing what the Bible says. Do what it says and watch God move. And you're going to start coming up after services in the morning and say to me, I want you to know I opened my mouth and, and God used me. How incredibly blessed I feel because I was able to share with my dad or my mom or my boss or, or a friend, uh, you know, about Jesus Christ. Listen, some of you have friends who are making decisions that are going to affect their life for the rest of their life. Some of you have friends that you could be counseling and sharing with and loving and helping if you would just open your mouth and tell them what God can do. And they'll come up to you later on, and they're going to tell you, you know what, I got a venereal disease. I was with somebody, and, or they're going to come up to you, and they're going to say, I got pregnant, or I got my girlfriend pregnant, or I got some girl pregnant. And all along, you could have spoken to them and said, listen, that's not the way to go. You ought to be stepping away from that and walking close to God. Come to church. Listen to the Word of God. Get right with God. Because there's so many of us, if I were to ask you this question, there are so many of us who have friends who, who don't know the Lord, if I asked you, how many of you have friends who don't know the Lord? We all raise our hands. I've got several people I love with all of my heart who don't know Jesus Christ. And so take the chance and open your heart and share what God does and live a testimony before them. And you may be surprised how God manifests himself. And so he's warning them. And he's saying, listen, don't have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Some will think, well, sin isn't that serious, and Jesus isn't necessary. Well, no matter how close somebody is to coming to Christ, if they refuse to do so, they're exhibiting an evil, rebellious heart because sin deceives us into thinking we are fine without God. In Proverbs 16, 25, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts in his own heart's a fool. Whoever walks wisely shall be delivered. Now notice in verse 13 how he speaks concerning um, in departing. He says, in departing from. Um, it, uh, verse 12, rather, in departing from the living God. He, he's speaking of standing off or standing aloof. It speaks of rejecting Christ or having nothing to do with him. And so finally, in verse 14 and to the end, he says, we've become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Well, it is said, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now, with whom was he angry uh, 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So, we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. The greatest proof of salvation is a continuing walk with Jesus Christ, because only believers who maintain unwavering faith in Jesus are genuine. Notice how he says, God became angry. God became angry with those who left Egypt, but Egypt never left them. The reason their corpses littered the wilderness is because they were unbelievers, and in spite of all he had done on their behalf, they continued in rebellion against him. Unbelief. One last thought about it. On one occasion, Jesus was ministering. He took his, three of his men up into a mountain and was transfigured before them. And as he went up into this mountain and was transfigured before, he left the others behind, and they were there at the base of the hill. As they were at the base of this hill, Jesus and his men come down, and as they come down, 
there are some religious leaders who are actually causing problems with his disciples. And so Jesus approaches and, and, and uh, confronts them for doing that. And, and as he begins to, uh, to deal with them, a man approaches Christ and begins to speak to him. And he says, listen, he says, Master, I brought my son to your men, my son who is severely demon-possessed, he says, who, who throws himself into the water and throws himself into the fire. And, and uh, in other words, he's being driven to death. And, and uh, I asked your men if, if they could, uh, would, uh, could or would deliver him, uh, and, and they could do nothing. And, and so I'm coming to you now, and, and I'm asking for you, if, if you can do anything, uh, would you please do something on my behalf? And, and Jesus' response to him was, well, if you can believe, all things are possible to the one who believes. And the man says, Lord, I do believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Now, I think that's an honest prayer. I do believe. It's not the things that I cling to. You see, unbelief is a, is a specific religious sin. I know these things, but I'm not clinging to them. I, I do have certain beliefs, but it's the areas of unbelief. It's the areas of, of not trusting you that I'm greater concerned about, and therefore, I'm asking you to do a work. I'm asking you to do something because it's not the things I believe that bother me. It's the things that I will not re or refuse to believe. Those are the things that are hurting me right now. What is it in your life that God has been trying to teach you where he says, when are you going to trust me in this? When are you going to just release it to me and allow me to show you what I can do when it's in my possession? How long are you going to hand it to me and then a couple minutes later walk up and say, can I see it again and take it back? How long is that going to happen? When are you going to get to the point of simply saying, I can do nothing, I'm going to trust you and see what you will do if I yield it to you? I believe very strongly that the Lord wants us to walk in faith, but through that walk of faith, we have many challenges. The children of Israel simply refused to believe, and in doing so, would not trust God, though he had proven himself over and over Therefore, God said, I was tired of this, and I let them die because of what they said. They're not going to trust me, then I'll let you die. Now, the others, they clung to me, they held fast to me, and therefore I deliver them. And so we all have options. Do I want to or do I want not to trust the Lord? From my perspective, every day I wake up and I say, God, help me today. Help me to trust you today because uh, yesterday is, is gone. Today's the new day. Help me to trust you today. Help me to believe you today. Help me to hold fast to you today because I want to walk faithfully until the day comes that I see you face to face. May I walk in faith every day.